Hello everyone. Mini Professor Olivier is back again. Are you ready for a new weekly analysis of financial markets? If you enjoy this weekly video, please show me your support and like it below, you will make my day. So, let's start. It's earnings time again. The quarterly roundup of company results is just about to kick off in America, with the banks, as usual, first out of the blocks. And expectations are for a massive rebound in profits year on year. That, of course, is largely an arithmetic issue. This time last year, Europe and the US were deep in lockdown, with non essential retail and hospitality shut down, and anyone who could was working from home. Compared with that, this year's results are bound to look a lot better. The expected growth in earnings for the three months to June is penciled in at 63%. That follows a 53% rise in profits in the three months to March, according to FactSet, a data provider. If earnings do match those forecasts, it will be the biggest rise in profits in a quarter since the recovery from the financial crisis 12 years ago. The big question now is whether it will have been better to travel than to arrive. The first six months of the year has seen markets continue to build on last year's V-shaped market recovery as we have moved from hope to growth. Last year markets rose in anticipation of a big earnings recovery, then this year they continued to rise, as those earnings started to be delivered. The data are unlikely to be so supportive from here. The comparison with the financial crisis recovery is instructive, because in many ways it was a very similar situation then. Profits fell sharply during the crisis, and bounced back quickly. Markets traced a similar path in advance of earnings, performing their usual role of anticipating the future. Then, in the summer of 2010, there was a meaningful correction as the year-on-year -year comparisons turned lower again, and investors worried that they had been too optimistic. We will have to wait and see whether we get a repeat, but the pattern looks similar so far. Earnings are being led by the most cyclical sectors, such as energy and financials. Shares in these types of company have also done well, with energy shares up by a third this year, and banks about 20% higher, both of them outpacing the wider market. The good news for investors is that the sharp rise in earnings in the first half of this year has kept valuations in check, despite the surge in share prices to new record highs. At the end of last year, the US stock market was priced at about 22 times expected earnings when the S&P 500 index stood at 3,800. Today, the P ratio is pretty much unchanged, despite the S&P 500 rising to today's level of more than 4,300. But markets are always looking forward. What matters is the news that is not yet priced in. If it's expected, then chances are it has already been priced in. The bond market also responds to expectations. In this case, about inflation and interest rates. As recovery gets underway, investors anticipate higher rates and bond yields rise in parallel. Because yields and prices move in opposite directions, that tends to be bad news for fixed income investors. The first six months have given bond investors an interesting round trip. In the first three months, Bond yields rose in the expectation that rising inflationary pressures would force the hand of central banks, and oblige them to tighten policy sooner than expected. U.S. 10-year Treasury yields rose from under 1% to 1.75% by March. Since then, however, the direction of travel has reversed, as investors have bought into the Fed's narrative that inflation will be transitory and the retreat from accommodative policy will be slower than feared. Last week saw an acceleration of that change of heart, and the 10-year Treasury yield fell as low as 1.25% at one point. Other factors driving bond yields lower include, fears about the spread of the Delta variant, which investors fear could stall economic recovery, the belief that other key central banks like the ECB are even less keen to raise rates than the Fed and the good old weight of money argument. Investors betting in the spring that yields would keep rising have been badly stung by the recent reversal, 
and some may now be bailing out of loss-making positions, pushing yields even lower as they buy back into the bond market. Investors at least don't have long to wait for guidance on where inflation is heading, because this week we're expecting prices data on both sides of the Atlantic. First up, on Tuesday is the June CPI announcement in America, which is the epicenter of inflation fears, after May's unexpectedly high print of 5% year-on-year price rises. U.S. inflation is expected to have remained strong in June, probably 4.9% year-on-year so just a smidge below the May reading which was the biggest in 13 years. There are upward pressures wherever you look. Input costs for manufacturing companies are rising faster than at any point since the 1970s. Workers are also getting the upper hand in negotiations with employers, as shortages are forcing businesses to pay up to find the right staff. In the UK, the CPI data is out on Wednesday providing a glimpse of how the unlocking of the economy is feeding through into activity and prices. The May reading over here was a lot lower than in the U.S., but at 2.1% it was still well above expectations. A further small rise to 2.2% year-on-year is expected for June. Also in the U.K., the central bank is keen to persuade investors that the rise in prices is temporary. The Bank of England believes that inflation will hit 3%, but fall back quickly. It continues to look through the data and investors are, for now, happy to take officials at their word. The other big data release this week is Chinese GDP on Thursday. This is interesting, because in some ways China is showing the rest of the world the way out of the pandemic. China was first in and first out and its lockdowns were a good three months ahead of ours. Its big jump in GDP therefore came in the three months to March, when the 12-month comparison was most favorable. The 18% rise in output in the first quarter will definitely not be repeated in the three months to June, and the only question is how much the rate of growth will fall. The consensus is for an 8% rise which is getting back to the 6% rate that is probably sustainable in the world's second-largest economy. Also of interest will be the extent to which China's economy continues to shift towards a greater focus on consumption. Retail sales are forecast to be 12% higher year-on-year. Back in Europe, attention is very much focused on the resurgent Delta variant, and whether it has the potential to derail the recovery. In particular, the impact on tourism is being watched, a key sector for some southern economies like Spain, Greece, and Portugal. Economic growth forecasts have been progressively raised for the region to around 4.8% year-on-year, and Europe was expected to be the only part of the world apart from Japan to show a higher growth rate in 2022 than this year thanks to the slower, but now accelerating rollout of vaccines. The fear is that the Delta variant may have the edge on that vaccine program, with the infection rate rising fast. Last week, Germany and France warned their citizens to avoid travel to Spain, where the infection rate has become the fastest in the region. The Netherlands is reintroducing restrictions on hospitality, only two weeks after easing them. And in the UK, a week ahead of so-called Freedom Day, the government is coming under pressure not to relax too quickly and despite evidence that there has been a weakening of the link between infections and hospitalizations and deaths. That's all for this week. I hope you found this markets update useful. Please don't forget to like it below, and you'll make my day. Thank you very much again. I wish you all an amazing week. Goodbye.